the city has, has really gotten us, you know, you know, nothing really good. I mean, you know, some good hits here or there, a shopping center here, some affordable housing there, you know, a, a new neighborhood there. But where is the big, you know, plan, right, to really think about what this place, what these places ought to be? Uh, that's what's missing, and that's what the book pushes uh, the mayor, who, who, who literally was just elected the week I wrote that, uh, to, to do it. that. And, you know, and of course, gives, hopefully gives, gives birth, not birth, but gives oxygen to efforts like yours. I think that's, that's a good way for us to start. I guess it's actually seven right now, but I guess that's a good point for us to introduce ourselves and talk a little bit more about Rose Cafe and then have you introduce yourself. Sure. Okay. Aisha, you want to start? Yes, so my name is Aisha Malone. I am a current fifth grade reading teacher. I teach at CICS Wrightwood on 83rd in California. Mm -hmm. I've been there for about five, going on five years. And now I'm a current entrepreneur. I am the founder and the owner of Rose Cafe, which is a reading cafe that potentially will be located on 95th. And we was going to talk a little bit more about Rose Cafe towards the end, but right now we want to give each other an opportunity to introduce one another. So I wanted to introduce my partner, Rebecca. Hi, uh, so I'm Rebecca Silverman. Like she said, I am the part her partner. Um, I am the co-founder and um, creative director at Rose Cafe. And Aisha and I have been working together for three years. I'm also a teacher at CICS Wrightwood. Um, and we are really, really excited to, to tell you more about Rose Cafe and get everyone else excited about it. All right, and I go next? Yes. <laughs> All right, um, I'm Lee Bay. I'm author of Southern Exposure, The Overlooked Architecture of Chicago South. I'm uh, here tonight, and certainly because I live in Pullman, glad to give um, uh, you know, some time and some attention to, and to learn more about, uh, about uh, Rose Cafe, which will be you know, in the neighborhood right next to me. So good to be here. And thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Yes, thank you for accepting our offer. I think one of the many questions that everyone has is the inspiration for the book. Mm -hmm. You know, well, we don't really want to talk a lot about what we read. We wanted you to talk more about it, and then we can kind of jump in from that. But we wanted you to tell everyone what inspired you to write the book in the first place. Well, you know, it's sort of, sort of two things, right? I mean, one, the big main thing, of course, is being a South Sider, born and raised and, and live here, you know, for four-fifths of my life or more and you know just you know experiencing the south side as south siders do there's a narrative that's told that deals with crime and and um, and disinvestment and that narrative is true right but uh but the idea that it becomes the only narrative uh of the south side was something that i wanted to be able to write to kind of write something that kind of addressed uh at the same time uh, three years ago there was the chicago architecture biennial uh, happens obviously every two years and they asked me to uh, do a piece of some sort photography piece um that dealt with architecture so naturally i picked photography of the south side while i was not even before i started shooting i had a meeting with jill petty who at the time was good sister who was um, um acqu an acquisitions editor at northwestern university press she asked me you got any book good good book ideas i said no i'm not even thinking about a book i'm trying to get this exhibit out she said, that's your book. That is your book. And those two things came together and gave us what we have today. I had a question. Oh, sorry. So a lot of your book, you talk about personal experiences. And we were just curious why you chose to take that and what you think that brought out by bringing personal experiences instead of just talking about the buildings. That, that's a good question. I. Um, as when I first envisioned the book and actually wrote the first drafts, it had nothing, it had nothing about me in it at all. Uh, it was, it, in fact, the book originally began uh, on 79th Street. You, you'll be, you're going to be rolling down 79th and you're going to come upon Pride Cleaners, which is one of the, the signature you know, images in the book. Mm -hmm. And I gave it to someone I knew whose who's opinion I respected and, 
they gave it a read and she said, you know, I like when you tell the stories about your father and the stories you growing up. And I was like, I'm not gonna put that in a book, right? I didn't, I didn't want to. So she said, just, just put it in. So I put it in at the middle, um, almost all of what you see at the beginning of the book. And then she suggested, well, move it up to the beginning, let the book begin that way. And I did it because I respected this person's opinion, not because I would have done this otherwise. But when I did it, it just seemed to all click and give the book an order. And then, uh, then from that point, I was able to put in a little bit more of my family history and, and, and to really understand really as I'm writing it and I'm researching it, how much the South Side is in me. Now, I'm not just this impartial observer cruising the streets who live over here, that there's a part of this that's in my blood. And, um, and that's, that's how we got where we are. And I was talking to Rebecca a little bit about that. I told her like he spoke a lot about his father and how he had a lot of conversation with his father and his father took him to a lot of buildings. And it kind of because I am from the South Side, born and raised, but I'm in Roseland, 60628. Mm -hmm. And then I said, well, that's something that like some of the boys need to hear, like that genuine good connection with your father, you know, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how that helped make you to who you are today, those pivotal moments that you had with your, doc, your dad in the car? Oh, yeah. I mean, more than I really knew at the time. And, and that's the funny thing about being a kid, you know, well, a teen, is that sometimes things are, you, are poured into you. And as adults, we pour things into teens, good things, hopefully, that we just have to trust that there's going to be a blooming of that at some later date. Um, because, you know, what the book kind of implies, but doesn't really say, I was a bit of a knucklehead. There was a reason why my father took me on that trip. Uh, mm -hmm. It was just too long to explain. I just figured I just would just begin it with him saying, come on, let's go. Um, but, you know, he, he didn't live long enough to see. He died the next year, if I'm not giving away too much of the book. Um, and so he didn't get a chance to see um, what he had poured into me. And I didn't get a chance to really know what it was until, you know, I got to the Sun-Times, you know, some... Uh, and became architecture critic some, you know, some, some 14, 15 years later. But it's important, you know, it's important to, you know, for us as men and particularly us as black men to have these experiences with our kids. I have three daughters and uh, for, for them, for two of them at least, um, I think reading the book was a, was a little emotional for them because they could see themselves um, in my spot. And they were like, oh, this is where that comes from. You know, this is why I know what I know and think, you know, you know, you know and, and when it comes to cities and architecture. So, you know, it's, you know, so we got to take the time, you know, and if he hadn't, my father hadn't that one day, um, I don't know what path I, I would be on. And that's important. That's important for young readers to read. Um, mm -hmm. And which makes us think about you as a teacher mm -hmm. and some things that you will teach your, your students as it pertains to these relationships. Exactly. Exactly. Um, you know, that, you know, there's, there's, and that there's informal ways of learning things, you know, so my architecture degree, if you will, didn't come from, you know, IIT, which I'm teaching at now, but, or, or, you know, or Yale or Harvard, you know, that first, that first chunk, that first bite came from my father, who, you know, who just had an innate knowledge of these kind of things and passed it on. I think speaking of mentors, if you could also speak to, um, I noticed that in the acknowledgments you mentioned, you're one of your teachers. And since we are both teachers, I'll probably say that a hundred times tonight, but we really loved that. I hope you could uh, speak more to that and what impact you think teachers had on you as well. Huge, huge. Three teachers are mentioned in my book. One is um, Dr. Lucille White, who mm -hmm. uh, she wasn't doctor then, but she was my seventh and eighth grade teacher at Caldwell Elementary School over 85th and grade year, right? And, I, and again, so I'm a little bit younger than I am when the book starts, you know, so I'm, you know, 12, 13, you know, in her class. I was a knucklehead in, the, in her class, but she could see something in me and would sort of give me time to answer questions. You know, if I gave a knucklehead an answer, she'd shake it off. Like, you know, what do you really think? And, and, and gave room for, for, me to, for me to be there. Um, you know, I got a chance to learn and appreciate art, newspapers through her. She taught us how to read Mike Royko, when Mike Royko was a columnist for the Sun Times. So she is, is, so Dr. White, who's retired, living in um, 
uh, Texas. I sent her a copy of the book a little while ago, and she texted me back because we stayed in contact roughly over the years. And I have a we have a mutual friend who really stayed in contact with her, and she was just on top of the moon to see her name in the book. And and I felt good about about doing that. That fine, like I was like, I, I can't give you back everything you gave me, but here's a little piece. Um, second teacher was um, was Thomas Doyle, my English teacher in um, high school at CVS, who you know as I think I mentioned in the book, kind of offhandedly mentions one day as, handing, as he had, he's handing back papers in my senior year, so I'm about to graduate. And he says, you are a pretty good writer. You ever think about journalism? Journalism, there you go. Because my major was print shop. And, and just a few months before, we went to a trade show at McCormick Place where they showed us the future of printing. And I could see then, 1982, that there weren't going to be guys sitting around operating printing presses the way they, you know, in the future, the way, the way it was then. I was terrified. Why am I in this school learning this? So when you said journalism, it was a lifeline. And then that sent me on my way. And, and lastly, it was uh, uh, Dr. Les Brownlee, who passed away. Uh, my uh, mentor and advisor and instructor at Columbia College, who, who basically taught me the, the bones of what I know journalistically and forced me to go on my first job interview. There's a story in the book about how that happens. So those three, you know, if any one of those three players aren't playing, um, plus my father and my mother, which I got to give credit to too, um, I don't, you know, you, you don't, I don't know where I would be now. I really don't. Without giving a lot away, a lot away about the book, you referenced the sides of the South side of Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, how big it is. Um, me and Rebecca was talking a little bit earlier about how it is really a big difference of how people see each side of town. Mm -hmm. um, Rebecca had a, a story she kind of wanted to share and then we wanted to kind of talk about your book after, the, after she kind of shared like the moment with her friend. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't, I didn't mention this before, but I'm, I'm from the northern suburbs of Chicago and I've lived on the north side of Chicago my whole life. Um, and I think that amongst my friends and family um, from when I've been working in Ashburn at CICS Wrightwood, I have probably had the most experience on the south side than any of my family. But when we were talking today and just talking about your book, when you mentioned that the South Side is the same size as Philadelphia, just the South Side by itself. It was, it was such a great way of putting that in terms for me because I had a, a conversation with my friend, the story that she was mentioning that um, my friend went to a coffee shop in Hyde Park and she said, oh yeah, it, it's this coffee shop is right by your school. And in my head, I was trying to think about what coffee shop is by our school. And I said, well, where is it? And she said, Hyde Park. And I said, that's really not by my school at all. That's about 20, 30 minutes away. And I think that it was just a good example of how people don't really know how big the South Side is or what, there's just a, like one single story of the South Side, like you'd mentioned before, that it is just a small area that is violent. And I, and I think that it is so important for people to, that don't know about the South Side to read this book if only just to see how big it is. And I loved when you said um, the South Side made Chicago, Chicago. I really loved that. Thank you, thank you. Um, that point about the size is amazing because we all, not all of us, but many Chicagoans tend to think it's just some place on the other side of Roosevelt Road and mm -hmm. there's no sense really how big it is. It's somewhere over there. And then um, and, and when I was writing that part of the book, again, without giving too much away, um, I was trying to figure out how do I describe the size of it? And I kept thinking, well, it's 100 and, I don't know, 86 something or this. I kept, I kept thinking, I kept thinking well, it's, it's as big as a city. There's got to be some cities. And I honestly didn't think I'd get as big as Philadelphia. I started off low and I was going my way up and up. And I thought, Philadelphia. So it's actually as big as Philadelphia or Detroit. So I thought Philadelphia just seemed to have a, seemed to have a, I mean, there was something about the way the words Philadelphia fell off the tongue mm -hmm. that made it sound like huge. You know, we think of Detroit, <laughs> it's, 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 you know, we don't know how big they're, but Philadelphia, why, you know, and so that's, that's how I got in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We saw a tweet um, from Southern Exposure. That, mm -hmm. I'll pull it up. Yeah. Um, that was tweeted yesterday. And it was, let me pull it up for a second. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
And we was wondering, since we're talking about the size of Chicago, because um, as we were discussing your book, she, because she sent this to me, I'm like, South Side? I'm like, that's not on the South Side of Chicago. Um, mm -hmm. She's like, yes, it is. If it's not North, it's South. I'm like, well, <laughs> there's a West Side and there's an East Side. And so we was wondering, when you talk about the size of Chicago, do you separate it North and South as well? Or do you bring in the East and West Side of Chicago? Because I know sometimes when you're from sh the South Side, you we too think it's all of the South Side. But me growing up, I was under the impression that closer to the water, like Stony Island and east of that was the east side of Chicago. Well, so 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 here's the thing, and, and, and you know, and this is this is a thing that you could be in bars, not that I go to bars, but this is a conversation <laughs> about whether whether or not Chicago has an east side. So as, as we think about Chicago as it's typically divided up, a north side, a west side, and a south side, and if we get into particulars, there's a far south side and a southeast side and a southwest side. But uh, but the, but the three large side, main sides, south, um, north, and east, I'm so, and south, north, and west, are roughly drawn on their proximity to the river, where they sit in, in relationship to the main branch of the river. Uh, so that's how we get those these three sides. So technically, Chicago does not have an east side. Okay. It has a neighborhood called east side, but that's like there's a neighborhood called uptown. We don't have an uptown in, in Chicago, okay. like a neighborhood by that, by that name. So when I'm talking about the South Side, as I say in the book, um, I'm talking about literally from the south branch of the river. I think actually I gave, I gave it Cermak. So it's Cermak to the, to the north, to the city limits to the south, you know, right by the Calumet River and beyond. And from as far east as the city goes, depending on where you are, you know, it's, you know, it could be Stony Island if you're in Woodlawn. And if you're further south, it could be, you know, um, Indianapolis Boulevard, you know, way to the east. And I, and I made Harlem the rough west borders. So in that, that's, that's, that's how the city, that's that big city within the city. Okay. Mm -hmm. hmm. I think oh, that's interesting because we had such different views. I just had never heard anyone say the east side. And we, it was a funny conversation we had. I was like, that's, the, the lake is the east. And she said, no, that's a neighborhood on the east side. Um, but we also, we wanted to talk about this tweet, not just for... The neighborhoods but also um, we thought it'd be interesting to talk about if there was a relationship with um, you know you talked about disinvestment and um, tearing down buildings on the south side and we wanted to know if there's any sort of relationship with the history of the buildings being torn down and your your opinion about the statues being um, taken down well it, it's it's a bit of um i That's guess in a sense it's kind of gallows humor, right, where you figure if there are three statues of Columbus in Chicago, one downtown, one on the near west side in Little Italy, one on the south side, which is the one that's going to get forgotten about? And of course, it's the south side one that kind of gets forgotten about. Now, the story does get into the, when the story gets into the weeds, the Sun-Times story, and says, and Alderman says, well, you know, we didn't forget about it. We, you know, we, we've been in talks about it. But when it came time to snatch up those statues, they got those two first. And, uh, and then there's a discussion about what happens to the, to the far south side ones. And it kind of, in a way, becomes a metaphor, uh, uh, you know, in a way, if you look at it that way, to kind of how the south side is like this afterthought. Oh, yeah, there are people in houses and schools and mm -hmm. a lake and a park out, out, out there. Okay. And I, I think that's a good transition, Aisha, for us to talk about um, this quote. If you wanted to read it, introduce it. So um, one of the reason we can pick some things that kind of stood out to us, um, pictures, but this particular quote spoke out to me. Mm -hmm. So according to the study, that differential over years means untold millions of dollars in potential real estate equity, cash that could have been pulled out to send kids to college, fund businesses, climb into or above the middle class, save a residential landmark or a future one, or rob from property owners on the south and west sides of Chicago. And the theft that was done neatly, cleanly, and legally with the balance sheet and a ledger. The south siders would have stood a better chance against a stick up on the street. And I think that kind of spoke to me because, you know, uh, my parents own a house over here in Roseland. Um, they have 
four college students. Um, I don't know if we were given those opportunities. Um, could you compare equity in our houses up here to the equity in the houses on the north side? And I kind of wanted you to kind of talk a little bit to the listeners about this so they can, for the future, how we prepare our kids and buying houses and the things we should be doing so that we have more options. You know, this, this question to me is the critical question. People drive through black neighborhoods and they say, why don't they take care of their stuff better? You know, and there's always kind of judgment uh, over, 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 over the condition in some black neighborhoods, right? And what you, and, but what you see is that, you know, the first, you know, you know, we, we, you know, we don't, we can start the story in the middle of the book, not my book, but I mean the metaphorical book. We don't even have to talk about the conditions such as contract buying and redlining that prevented black folks from, from owning houses um, or, or, or equitably owning houses, you know, in the 50s and 60s and 70s, and all that accumulated wealth that, could, that was lost there. We can, we can start that sentence in 1990, right, if we wanted to, and, and look at a house, let's say in, let's say in Roseland, right? And let's say, or, or Pill Hill, and look at a house in Skokie, right? Same architecture. If I were to drop you off in both neighborhoods blindfolded, you couldn't tell one from the other architecturally. And look at what the house in Skokie, how that's appreciated compared to the house in Pill Hill. That man, that woman, that family who has a house in Skokie can pull, then pull equity out of that house to do all the things that we talk about here, fix the house up, send the kids to school, do the things that they want to do. Um, it be, because their house is worth more. Uh, uh, harder to do. Uh, when it's uh, when it's on the south side, you know what made the point for me was when my kids were little, we, we, dro we drove around a lot, and we could see the differences in neighborhoods. And I, and I told my daughters once, because we were living in Beverly at the time, and I said, you know, if the roof goes bad, it's twenty thousand dollars whether I'm in Beverly or whether I'm in Inglewood. The question is, am I going to have to reach into my pocket and pull the twenty thousand dollars out, or or somehow get some kind of financing because or I'd be dubious because banks still aren't lending in our communities where they should, or are bankers knocking at my door because they see I have a house that's worth enough that I can pull the money out of it and get the, get the roof fixed. And that's the tale of the two cities right there. WBEZ, if you haven't read this, it's worth reading, uh, checking out, did a series maybe a month ago about how Chase Bank loaned more in Lincoln Park home loans, just in one neighborhood, than they did to the entire south and west side of Chicago. Uh, and so it's like, so, there, so that's, the, that's the theft. I'm talking about, you know. So with the stick up man, you can run, you can catch him, you can mm -hmm. hope the police catch him. With this, you're on the wrong side of the equation, you suffer for a lifetime. So what do you um what do you advise? How do you talk to those that's buying houses right now and um those who are trying to start new businesses in these different neighborhoods? You have I have friends that started businesses over here on 115th in Michigan. Then I have mm -hmm. friends that started a business on um, 79th in um, California. Yeah. Well, you know, apply for, do everything you can, any program, any incentive to write down that differential, right? I mean, you know that a house in neighborhood X is going to be worth this much price this much um, and in a neighborhood wide on north side it's going to be you know a lot more I mean so that you know banks sometimes do have their you know there are people like um, neighborhood housing services and others their city programs find them all right and and, and do, do your best to kind of write down that that differential as best you can it doesn't equalize it until the banks get right uh, but it helps it in a way. But it also gets this other thing that, you know, when we, we blame people for moving out of black communities, right? And oftentimes we don't want to move, but it's like, what you gonna do if, if, I, if I buy a house for $102,000 and it needs $89,000 worth, worth of work, uh, that Franklin Wright house, but you know, I'll say that till later. Uh, it needs $89,000 worth of work. What, what am I gonna do? You know, what, what is a person gonna do? So, um, but I do think that there's, you know, there's areas in the city, areas on the South side where I think that differential is a little less, and you can see some relief coming. I think the east side of Inglewood is one of those places. Um, I don't want to say the word gentr regentrify, but I think there's going to be, there is some kind of bounce 
in real estate prices that if banks are, resp are responsive, they can lend to black folks in that area uh, in respect to that, that, uh, res that response. So, so I, I think you can find Bronzeville, of course, uh, some particularly northern end of it. So there, there, there are these kind of places where you can kind of get in, but it's, it's a tough thing because you, you, you're fighting against a system, in, you know, in, in a way, and that's, that's, that's tough business. Mm -hmm. We got into a lot of um, different conversations without asking you, how do you deem a building beautiful? How do you, de how did you choose the buildings you chose? Um, we went through the book uh, several times. We saw some buildings that we thought were absolutely gorgeous. And then we saw some that were like, um, how did that, I'm wondering how that makes the book. And so we were just wondering if you can speak to like future artists or um, people who is into architecture and things like that. How do we look at buildings a different way after reading your book? Well, you know, I, I think uh, in terms of what I chose for the book, you know, there's a couple of things. One, because I want to push against the narrative that the South Side is just, you know, just bombed out, disinvested place. So I wanted to find buildings that were visually, that were, that were in use, right? There's one exception. Uh, but buildings that were in use that what that I thought were um, were were unique that it, that if you if that and, and that I, I felt that many Chicagoans maybe even some Southsiders hadn't seen and um, so I, I wanted people to be able to thumb through the book and think why don't I know about this? why where is it what you know and you know why don't I know about this and really look through it um, but in terms of like how to assess a building you know, it really is an eye of the of the beholder I mean um, certainly there are um, kind of Western ways of assess, assessing a, bu a building, you know, from its, you know, through its beauty, and, you know, you look at symmetry and, you know, how much glass is there compared to how much wall, and if there's a lot of wall, and you know, what's the materials like, but, but, um, but also the use and the function of a building also, you know, playing to it as well. Yeah. Is it doing the thing that it's meant to do? Um, okay. you know, so it's all these things kind of play together. I think that's a, a good chance. Would you mind if I pulled up some pictures that, from the book? Please. Mm -hmm. So one of the, um, just to go through. So this was an example for me of a building that we were just interested why you chose to put it in the book because I think that if I was driving around, I would just drive right past this building and not think anything of it. Well, uh, I don't have that eye. So we just, we weren't sure. Well, you know, the, the thing about that building is if you were to drive down that block, 89th Place, you'll see more traditional looking houses um, from this era, late 40s, you know, through the, through, the, through the 60s. And then you see this minimalist one-story building there. So it's going to jump out visually, you know, in, in the context. Uh, the reason why it's in the book is because it's by John Matusimi. John Matusimi was a black architect, um, first black partner for a major uh, you know, me meaning white, sadly, architecture firm. Uh, he designed the Ebony Jet Building. He designed Quadrangle Towers on 67th and South Shore, Truman High School, I think, I mean, Truman College, I think also uh, Olive Harvey College. But this is the house that he built for himself. And he built it in 1954, which is really, really early for this kind of architecture, um, particularly uh, on the South Side, which is largely built up by the, by the 1950s. So because of those things, and he studied, studied under Mies van der Rohe, you can see a bit of that. Now that window has been altered, obviously, since it's been, been, been uh, built. But you can, you can see the minimalist, the Miesian kind of minimalism there. Uh, and, and the building just, uh, it just jumps out. So, um, you know, notable architect, uh, unique house. There's only one like that in Chicago. Uh, and those things are the reason why the, the house made it to the book. Okay, but before I say, I just want to mention one thing. A lot, I've noticed a lot of people raising their hands and writing in questions. We're going to save some time at the end for questions that people have been writing in. So if you have one, you can feel free to write it in as we go. Um, but I just want to talk back to your, when you mentioned the context of the building. And I think that's something that's really important to think about. Just like in a museum, if I were to see this building compared to the other ones, I think it would have had a different story. And it, it just goes along with how you say so often that, you know, these buildings are overlooked and maybe they, it would have been more popular, more people have known it if it was somewhere else. And 
I guess I just wanted to kind of compare it to this because I think I've never seen this building or heard of it. And it just, to me, I don't have to have an architectural background to think that this building is so beautiful. And so I was just looking at the two and thinking, how could they both be, you know, in the book? And we were just wondering like what, what your process was of deciding what buildings to put in the book because you even mentioned you know that there were so many more that mm -hmm. could have been in there so how did you decide it, it was tough it was really tough it's like you know i, I got three daughters let's say picking out which one i like the best i like them all i love them all i want them all <laughs> next to me. And, that's, and that's how i wanted this book to be but you know you just only have so much time and so many pages so basically you you eat until the dinner bell sounds for the most part right um i wanted to put the regal theater in there and just ran out of time. Um, if you know, you, you know the Southeast side, many of you, you know there's this, there's this crazy looking Moorish temple of a small church right at 79th and, and um, I shouldn't say crazy, it's unique looking, uh, right at 79th underneath the Skyway. And I had a whole, I did the research on that, the whole history, I took some sample pictures, but then I just ran out of time and couldn't photograph it all. So you run out of time. So, but this one actually was one of the last ones I shot. Uh, the, Lou, uh, the Lou Palmer house, Lou and Georgia, Palmer House, and that uh, is what it was most recently, and then the, um, the, the D. Harry Hammer House before. The Hammers were a prominent family um, who built this house in, I think, I, think, I think it's 1889. And, you know, and this gives you a sense of what old Chicago post-fire, this is how the 1% live, right? These big, giant urban manses, right, like, like this, um, you know, often in neoclassical styles, um, and, you know, insides, you know, woodwork, Fires, fireplaces, everything to, to, to die for. And then it gets sold after in the 50, in the 70s, and even early 80s, to Lou and Georgia Palmer, a black prominent couple, who give the house its own history. This is one of the places where Harold Washington's mayoral campaign was incubated, successfully incubated and launched. Um, and Lou Palmer had his own you know, career as a journalist, Georgia as a as a um, as an activist and organizer and thinker in black Chicago. These, this was black royalty, right? And they, passed, and they passed away and, uh, in the 2000s, and the house is owned uh, by a developer who I don't name because I know him and I'm, I'm wanting him to do something with this house. Uh, so I didn't want to shame him. I wanted him to just succeed, right? I'm looking at you. Uh, but, but since the Palmers have left, you can see what's happening. I mean, you know, you know it's open to the elements. You know, the, and these, these pieces are falling off. And it's just, what is the future for a building like this? It likely won't be torn down because it sits in a landmark district, but if it wears down, if it falls down, it becomes this kind of, oh, well, you know, kind of thing. If, the, if finding these images was difficult, how did you end up finding your cover picture? If, if, if it was difficult to find the rest of these, how did you say, ah, so this is how, this is the picture that I introduced my book with? Well, you know, so this is the funny thing. Um, um, this was not my pick for the cover. I got over, this is the only thing I got overruled on. <laughs> and, and I'll talk about that. Now, the reason why it was in the book, oddly enough, oddly enough, has to do with an overlooked, because I thought it was overlooked. When, so the, so the architecture biennial asked me to do the exhibition, which included this photo, back in 17. In late 16, 2016, there was a documentary on PBS about Errol Saarinen, the architect who did this building. Um, had all of his known buildings in it, the uh, TWA headquarters in, uh, in the airport, and um, it's now a hotel in New York, the St. Louis Arch. I mean, really one of, the, one of the great architects of the 20th century, but he died early. So this is one of his last projects. And as they're showing all of his work, and they're showing all the work he did for colleges, and his son was one of the producers of it, they skipped over this building. Didn't show it, didn't mention it. And I thought to myself, now, there's only one Saarinen, maybe one and a half, and, that's, and if there's a half, it's also on the campus. But, there, but, but there's only one, essentially one Saarinen in Chicago, the America's you know, first city of architecture. And I thought, if they could skip over a Saarinen, it's, it's because it's on the south side, whether that's true or not, that's what I thought, it's the south side. I kept thinking, well, if it was on the north side, they wouldn't have missed it. If it were in the south loop, they wouldn't have missed it, but they missed it because it's on the south side, and I'm mad. And then that, in a way, gave birth or gave some impetus to the um, exhibition because that was one of the pictures that I printed up large. And, the, and I'll tell you this, even though it was at the DeSable Museum, 
which is just west of the University of Illinois, University of Chicago campus, I still had people come through there from the university who would say, now, where is this building? Mm -hmm. On your damn campus, that's where it is. You know? <laughs> but uh, so, so, that, that, so, that, so that's why. Now, you got to put it on the, on the cover. I wanted Pride Cleaners for the cover. Uh, but they put this on the cover uh, because they thought it showed better and because they could do a thing with the reflection in the water. If you look at the book title, Southern Exposure is reflected in the pool underneath there. So, there I got, right, right. See, <laughs> I, got, I, got, I, got, I got outvoted for that reason. Yeah. That's funny that you mentioned Pride Cleaners because that was the next picture that we wanted to talk about. Yep. You know, you know what? You know, like, what can you say about this building, right? Yeah, I mean, I you know, here's here's a building you can tell from the architecture around it, built in an existing neighborhood, Chatham, that's largely built up by the time this 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 building comes along, okay. and it's not just a 1950s building; it's from 1959, but it's a radical building. It has a hyperbolic paraboloid roof. There's one for the students. <laughs> hyperbolic paraboloid roof. It's a self-supporting concrete roof. So it doesn't have any columns, or any supports on the inside. And it's done that way so that all the cleaning equipment, dry cleaning equipment, and all those people and what it takes to make it run, that they can be in there and do their job without having to run into posts and beams and columns all the time. But just, a, just a, an incredible building that's hung on, not been restored. Now, the, now, the, now a new owner, since I took this picture, a new owner has repaired that window and painted, spruced it up a bit so it looks a little better. But just an incredible, I mean, you, you will go throughout the entire Chicago and you'll never see a building like this. And there's very little written about it. When I, when I, when I looked up to see what was written about it, well, all I could find was what I wrote about it 20 years ago when I was architecture critic at Sun Times in my last column before I left. Um, and, and even that was a response to a reader question asking about this building. So that's the thing about this and others is that, is that they're off the radar visually to, from people, but they're also left out of the architectural canon, the, the stories and things that we um, publish and, and, and hold. When we talk about architecture in Chicago, this building is absent until now. Yeah, it is very beautiful and very striking. It really, it really stuck out to us. And then this was um, the last one that we wanted to talk about just because um, it is something that we're both very familiar with um, because of its proximity to where, well, for many reasons, but also we are hoping to have Rose Cafe um, very close to this. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, this is, a, this is a new, you know, new red line terminal. And what I wanted to do with this part of the book was to show that there's still stuff happening on the south side that, you know, things didn't just stop in 1951 or things that stop with urban, re urban renewal, but there are still things happening. So here is a huge station, $300 million when it opened a couple of years ago, uh, expansion of the existing Red Line station. And, um, you know, it looks, looks more like an airport terminal. I, I, when I took this photograph, I took the train in from downtown, um, you, know, uh, you know, as I had been doing for a million years when it was the old Red Line station, and then I get off it. I don't know where I am. And, a, a, a sister comes up to me and she says, do you know how to get out of here? And I said, no. <laughs> said, We're going to find this thing out together. And we've blundered out and, you know, and found a way to the, to the sunshine. But, uh, but, a, but a good investment to the, for, the, for the area. And again, showing that these kind of things are still going up. You've you got to invest in these places. You can't just let them lie, lie fallow. you gotta, you got to keep this thing together. And this station helps do that. And with the uh, revenue, yeah. sorry. Well, we just had a recent conversation, Aisha and I, and another woman from Roseland, of just about the fact that the red line does stop at 95th, and how there are so many people that have to get off at the train there and then take a bus, and that the city is doesn't stop at 95th; it does go further. You know exactly when when this station was when it was planned under Rahm Emanuel, he had this dream that the L was going to extend out to 130th somehow. It's going to yeah. keep going um, south from where it is and kind of angle over e east to Michigan and somehow end up, I don't know where that, I, I think those plans are probably not going to happen, at least not happen in our, in our time, but at least it was an acknowledgement that the L stops you, you know, 30 blocks short of the rest of the, of the remainder of the city and how um, it creates a, a burden for people who have to negotiate those last you know, five or six miles of the city in, in many times. Um, I'm hoping that um, 
some kind of way is uh, done to create it, to extend this, or maybe with Metra, the Metra Electric, that there's some way to run CTA, CTA trains on that since the gauges are similar. Um, something to kind of bring that, that, to kind of knit that large south part of the city, far south part of the city to this place and, to, and into downtown. The fact that this building is a relatively new building and considering, you know, all the new businesses that people are getting into, do you see yourself and also with some of the architect that you didn't cover in Rosen that you said could fill up a book, mm -hmm. do you see yourself revisiting this thing, showing more architect as it comes up in Chicago? Oh yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think if, and again, this is really a question from my publisher, if they're listening, uh, but, but, but I think that either um, at some point, another edition, an, ex an expanded edition of this one that gets any other stuff, updates some things, or a part two will be good. Um, so yeah, because, you know, it's a, it's an ongoing story. When, when, you know, when I first wrote this, I thought, well, this, this could be my retirement project. This would be something I can keep adding on to every, every, every few years. Um, I think there's something to be said about Michigan Avenue um, uh, in Roseland, as, as it, you know, from uh, the, the avenue, as it used to call it back in the old days, from 107th past 115th Street. I write about that on occasion for the, in the Sun-Times. I'm on an editorial board, and I've written, I think, one or two editorials about saying how the city should, you know, it's is good that they pay attention to that now and that they continue to, but there's so much. There, there, there's, there's so much. There's Pill Hill, there's Mary Nook, you know, there's all kind of places uh, that I didn't get to that hopefully subsequent, um, sub subsequent editions will get to. It was surprising not to see um, some of the Pullman, because I'm familiar with the Pullman and the old landscape down there. It was really surprising not to see more pictures in there, and then knowing that you live in the community. Oh, Pullman's there. Pullman's got, um, it's got Market Hall. It's got, uh, it's got about four, about four buildings of Pullman. Four out of sixty. I mean, that's that's more than that's more than Avalon Park got. That's where I was. That's where I grew up. So, um, but you know, you 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 you're looking to give a taste, like a survey, right? And um, and so let people know that there's that this is out there and there's more. It's not meant to be comprehensive in terms of giving you uh, an encyclopedia of every building, but just enough to give you a taste of what's of what's out there. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that we um, can move to some of the audience questions and I noticed some people rose their hand okay so the first question I see is are there any buildings in Chicago by black women architects yeah um there are there is well well you know in terms of a team um the um the uh the modern wing of the art institute uh Renzo Piano's design architect uh but the architect of record you know the person the firm uh, and who uh, puts all those drawings together and gets the permits and does all the kind of things and the glue that holds the thing together uh, is Dina Griffin, uh, uh, her firm, Interactive Design. And Dina Griffin is a, is a black woman. She also did, um, her firm also did, um, I want to say Adam Clayton Powell School over on South Shore Drive and 74th. Um, so yeah, I mean, and there's Ramona Westbrook who did on the west side some of the replacement housing for Henry Horner. Uh, the, the Westgate Village, the kind of the new community that they popped up that, that was built there in the 90s, early 2000s, late 90s, early 2000s. So yeah, there, there are, there are. Did any, did any of them make it to Southern Exposure? Didn't make it to Southern Exposure. Did not make it to Southern Exposure. Oftentimes the, the, the architecture was, was either too new or I thought it was known. Um, I think, um, I think in the, sub and, and, then, and then often, and then generation before, them. So Dina is about, without telling too much, Dina and I are roughly the same age group, let's say. So the, so, so the generation of architects before them, who are black women, who would, would have been our parents, if you, if you will, you know, there needs to be more scholarship done on the work that they did um, as well. And it, and it hasn't yet been done, at least not yet hasn't been published, but, but will, and then and, and that will inform my work and, and, and other work as well. Next, we just have a comment that I think was nice. He said, um, not a question, just a comment to pass along. I live in Detroit and previously lived on the north side of St. Louis. So much of this resonates with me. My dad, who was the one who showed me around and got into buildings, gave me this wonderful book and I can't wait to read it. 
Ah, uh, well, well, thank you to, to, to <laughs> both, and thank you to Dad, man, doing what we do, right? Mm -hmm. And then um, the next question I wanted to read was, how would you recommend these buildings be protected from demolition? Hmm, good question. Well, well, I think that, you know, and this is my own ego fueling this, but I think every building that's in this book that's not currently a landmark should be given landmark status. So that would be Chicago Vocational High School, Pride Cleaners, um, the ones that are old enough, the 95th Street L Station, too new, uh, but, uh, but buildings of a certain vintage should be. Um, that's the first thing, because in Chicago, uh, landmark status makes it difficult for anyone to get a demolition permit. So that helps protect the building. Um, so that, that's the first thing uh, that, that I think that has to be done and the most important thing. Okay. Um, so I think that those are actually um, some of the best questions that we had. Um, I think in just, that's a good place to stop, just talking about moving forward and protecting these buildings. Um, we also just wanted to spend the last couple of minutes just talking a little bit about um, Rose Cafe and what we're doing. Um, but we first wanted to really thank you so much for doing this talk with us. And we, we wanted to talk with you as our first person to talk with, not because of how much we love the book and how powerful it was, um, but just because we think that you also share our vision of wanting to bring more things to the South Side and make people see how, how there are already great things on the South Side. Um, so we, just to share this, so, Aisha, do you want to speak more about Rose Cafe? I think, um, I don't know how much you know, but I am from the south side of Chicago. Um, during the Black Revolution, currently, my neighborhood was torn up. Um, buildings was torn down, glass windows was broken. And some of the people, the response when we were talking in the neighborhood, they was like, well, you don't own anything here. And so I'm like, well, Maybe it's time I do, you know, but that challenged me because I am a current teacher, but I do know we need something to do in our neighborhood. I travel from my neighborhood to Hyde Park to do anything, um, but it's time for us to have something in my neighborhood. I tried to bridge, do something that was different than what we typically see, boutiques, bars, and things like that. I wanted to bring literacy into the neighborhood because I know that with literacy, it could promote healthy conversations. And, you know, that I think that's one thing that we're lacking in our neighborhood is how to communicate with each other. So I wanted to do it in our neighborhood so they can have access to what some people have on the north side. You know, there is a difference between the resources that we have versus the resources that the north side has and I think it's just basically because no one has passionately tried to do it for the right reasons. So I um, partnered with a couple of people to bring books and then now we're trying to we're negotiating with the, uh, the late the least the landlord on 95th and we're getting ready to try to open up our walk-up window in October. Um, Rose Cafe we sell books Right now, currently, we have an online bookstore. We want to let everyone know that you can purchase Southern Exposure right from our website. Um, we have done, we have physical books that we're selling, people have donated, and we're doing pop-up shops to promote that. We are selling t-shirts and we are doing more, we are trying to bring arts into the community. We have a lot of young authors right now trying to let us hear about their books and things like that, which is something that I really wanted to do. Um, my sister was like, yeah, um, my friend got a book and she want to um, bring it around here and tell you how, how it sounds. But that was exactly what I wanted for some of the arts in our neighborhood that like to be shined on them. Because not only is it beautiful buildings in our neighborhood, it's educated people in our neighborhood, it's mature people in our neighborhood. And I thought that this was a good time to highlight those people as well. It, sorry, I don't, I don't want to cut you off. No, I'm done. It, I could talk for days about it, so I'm, I'm done. Yeah. No, you know, it, it really is important. I mean, you know, one of the transformative portions of my young adulthood was going to uh, Third World Books uh, on, on 78th, 79th and Cottage Grove. I remember going there to see lectures, and I was in my late teens and, and early 20s, you know, trying to be, trying to be smart and worldly and, and going there and meeting all kinds of people. And, uh, and, and, and the, 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 the effect that a, a good bookstore can have, I mean, there's one on 87th Street, the name just flew out of my mind. It's in my old neighborhood, just east of Stony Island. Um, under, 
I forget the name of it. But, but, but these kind of bookstores, these kind of spaces, uh, particularly in black neighborhoods, where we can feel safe to, to talk and to do things um, and to read and to you know, have authors come in, the, the, the impact of those things is, are, you know, the, the impact is, is immeasurable. We look forward to having authors come to the cafe to read their books. We look forward to having book launches. We're looking forward to book clubs. We just want to get on this side of history. And Rebecca has been phenomenal. She has been very resourceful. She's she the one who got me super excited about a lot of these things that we're doing, like the author talk and the books that we're reading. So as we read... So the exposure, it made me think like he want to bring beauty over here in that way. We can do it in this way. So it was super inspiring to read. And I really appreciated how you did take the time to come and give us some highlights over here. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to be invited. Thank you. Thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you. And we'll, talk soon. we'll talk soon. <laughs> And thank you for all of your um, promotion on Facebook. I think on all of our social media, whenever we write anything, you're the first person to like it and write for Spon to like always get really excited. <laughs> right, when we had a farmer's market and the first person bought Southern Exposure, like, oh, we have to take a picture for Mr. Bay because he'll be so excited about this. He's been so nice. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. It's good, you know, it's, it's good to spread the word, uh, you know, particularly for a good thing. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, thank you again, thank and you again, we'll talk soon. All right, take care. Take care, everybody. Bye.